All right, guys. July is going to be courtroom month for us. We're doing six movies. All of them have been in a courtroom in some way. <laughs> the courtroom is involved. Yeah. Yep. It's a theme of the movie. You make the courtroom sound like God. Well, to, to us moviegoers, we kind of love the courtroom. We do. And it's been a thing that's Hollywood has moved away from for whatever reason. Primal Fear, the movie we're going to talk about in a second, is right in this amazing courtroom kind of run yeah. that we had in the 90s. Sierra, what happened in the courtroom film? They're on TV now. They're on TV. I was Law thinking, and Order ruined it? I was watching this and I was like, oh, this is the night of. Like, this this would just be the night of in, in 2020, you know, if they were making it or something like that. Like, if you were like, we have this really like, cool idea for a legal thriller. It's got this incredible star-making role and that was Riz Ahmed and Night Of. And it's yeah. just like, they would just do this on HBO now. You want me to tell you what happened to it? Yeah. Uh, they did a lot of them and probably too many of them. Like, this specific year when Primal Fear was released, I counted seven courtroom dramas or comedies. That's a lot. And you could make the case that think they, they were overweighting the legal profession. Uh, no, I, th I, I think we'll probably talk about why there was such a boom in this kind of storytelling. I think OJ Simpson and Court TV is a huge part of why this stuff blew up in the way that it did in the 1990s. What happened with him? The Jews? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, uh, interesting story. You should look into it. 2003 uh, Yards was it, and then did some TV, right? Yeah. Naked and gun? Something really Hurts? kind of funky happened. Oh, yeah. I, didn't, I didn't follow that. Yeah. Uh, so because of that, I think that there, there was an even greater interest in court. Also, I think it's fair to say that true crime, documentary, and podcasting yeah. has kind of obviated a lot of our bloodlust for these kinds of stories. So I have John Grissom. Grisham? John Grisham. Or Marquise Grissom's son. John, John Grissom. Grissom. Yeah, okay. <laughs> John Grissom? I think Vaughn Grissom is actually Marquise Grissom's <laughs> no, I son. Uh, I, to me, it starts there with that and Presumed Innocent. Those with the Scott Thoreau book and then Grisham. Yeah. And those books, and it just unleashed this new modern version of, and all the stuff started trickling into movies. And it starts with Presumed Innocent and it just keeps going. We get a few good men. That becomes a monster. JFK, my cousin Vinny. Then the next year, the firm and Pelican Brief come mm -hmm. out the same year. Get the client, Just Cause, Primal Fear, Time to Kill. Devil's Advocate, 97, The Rainmaker, Liar, Liar. What were the, what were some of the ones that didn't make it? That they had? They were not successful? So like, you said there were seven in 97. I don't even remember the seven. Uh, I mean, I can give you the list. Primal Fear, The Crucible, which is oh, the kind, Crucible. You know, kind of a courtroom drama when you think about it. Do you count Sleepers staged. as a courtroom I drama? Do. I yep. have Sleepers here, Before and After, Ghosts of Mississippi, Night Falls on Manhattan, The People versus Larry Flint. It's a pretty long list. So I think it was those books and then OJ. Yeah. And then post OJ, it was like, man, legal movie? Yeah. And there's other dynamics to it. It's always a great spot for a lead actor. Oh, yeah. They're oh, great yeah. star parts. Yeah. Because it's there's, probably it's theater. You just yeah. get to walk around and monologue. It's What's great. a better star part than being the, either a defense attorney or a prosecutor? Yeah. It, it might be the ultimate job for a movie star. That's well, an interesting like question. The, it's the closest thing to really, actor. But detective's really good, too. It is. Right? But, I'm chasing a case, and I've got some demons of my own. But there, you don't see a lot of lawyers, like even... Paul Newman in The Verdict, who's like a raging alcoholic, is still like pretty good at being a lawyer. Like you don't see a lot of lawyers that like I don't talk very much like detectives do sometimes. I think one thing that the Tarot and Grisham books did that these movies picked up on is it also made the lawyers detectives. It was the lawyers in the cases who were solving what had happened in the case, yeah. which is unusual as opposed to the cop or the PI. So by like putting those two jobs together, the yeah. guy who gets to figure it out and then give the speech to the jury made it like the ultimate star part. Bill, there, did you ever think about going to law school? Only to be a sports agent. I had a sports agent run there. <laughs> college, Interesting. <laughs> before I realized that I had a chance to maybe get paid to write sports columns. Who were your guys? Did you have sports agents? You I was just like, you know, I could be a good sports agent. You okay. were looking at Falk? And yeah, you're like, I would know I what players to target and I could just be in the room and It's talk. not too late, man. Well, I haven't ruled it out. Yeah. Uh, I, you know, we could talk about that later. Did, did, had you considered it? No. I didn't have the grades, but I also didn't have the, the discipline to like read all that stuff. Yeah. Mm. We've done a couple courtroom movies that are ineligible for courtroom month, including The Verdict and A Few Good Men, which was, I think, the first non sports movie rewatchable we ever did. Yes. Right? It was the first rewatchable we did. Like called, it was the inaugural rewatchable. The Verdict has my favorite courtroom scene ever, which we discussed in yeah. detail. His when, closing. The jury 
wants to know, can they oh. go? <laughs> can they go over what they were asking? And Jack Warden just looks up to the sky. <laughs> and does the, that's though. That's the top for me. There's been some great just moments, and they have some of the same beats, like right where it's like the the lawyer kind of going rogue with the like in in Primal Fear. He has the guy plead the fifth, and the the opposing side has to like do the compliment. Bacon does that in a few good yeah. men too. Yeah. And the cross examination, <laughs> Kendrick, man, that was something. So they have like it, it he's got the foes on the other side, but there's always some sort of relationship. Like either they dated or they were drinking buddies or they were softball. So you got that. They always have the scene where the other side is like, he's got a lawyer. Who is it? Yeah. This it's guy like it's can't Chris Ryan. A lawyer. <laughs> yeah. No, he got Chris Ryan. CR? <laughs> what? <laughs> so they have that scene. They have the scene where there's the the guy sitting in for the testimony who maybe you don't, you don't want to fuck with, but the, the lawyer doesn't. Maybe I'll start pushing the envelope and then the guy starts getting mad, which yeah. this movie has. We have the... Uh, there's always a moment where the judge is like, I'm warning you, counselor. Yeah, yeah, I have that. I have the I'm warning you now. Or in my chambers now. That's another good one. Um, we have... There's always the phone call with our hero where he's like, what? And then we go yeah. and it's like a dead body. Yeah. Um, we have R.I.P. The, Joey Pinheiro. The judge, when they go, be careful, counselor. Yeah. Treading on very dangerous ground here. <laughs> like, I, I started to think, you know, the writer strike right now, they're fighting about AI. And, and one of the reasons they're fighting about AI is because you could take 10 of these scripts and just pump out a courtroom drama with all the beats, right? I mean, there are some very recognizable tropes, yeah. I mean, the other one that you that I love from all these movies is there's always something like in Primal Fear, it's the South River Project. And yeah, all, the side like, thing. There's some complicated investment scheme that doesn't actually matter towards the end of the movie. It's just a B story in, that yeah, they felt like the, give it some meat. In the firm, it's like the Cayman Island mob like hiding their money and taxes stuff, but it's really about whether Mitch is going to get away from the firm. And so I, I like the South River project here where it's like, we got to get to the bottom of this with yeah. Manny from Scarface. Yeah. Um, they also have the one where the guy goes to see his client. He's like, I need to see my client alone. <laughs> yeah. That's always in there. <laughs> yeah. Um, or the guy coming back because he's mad at the client for some reason. There is also like when that happens, there's often a moment where the lawyer is like, I'm trying to save your life. Don't you <laughs> right. understand me that? And the, the, the defendant's like, you're not trying to save shit. You know? <laughs> You've got to work with me, yeah. not against me. Yeah. There's yeah. another one in this movie where the the key witness, in this case, the psychologist, is embarrassed by the opposing side yeah. in a cross-examination. There's always one of those where it's like, we thought this was going to help our case and it destroyed our case. Right. Well, and then the 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 hero is either like gear in this movie, yeah. Whereas like ladies' man, a little scummy, or we have like the up and coming. This or is, is my really first case, shallow, and that this is going to be he's going to learn a lesson. Redemptive, yeah, it's, yeah. Or it's the the Paul Newman in the verdict. Yeah, this is his last. Daniel Caffey doesn't care. He's always just doing plea bargains. Yeah, Can't wait to get out shot. of. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, there's always a lesson. Yeah, even in Time to Kill. Um. Where that McConaughey plays Jake, but you know, he's taking this case, but ultimately he learns a lot about how the other side lives, mm -hmm. race and the state that he grew up in and just how to be a better person. Right. There, um, it's funny that they're all morality tales because okay. they're like the scummiest movies ever. This is like such a scummy movie. I know. Oh my fear, God. That's what know? makes it good. Yeah, it's great. It's really, it's so fun. <laughs> be careful, counselor. <laughs> Treading on dangerous ground here. So then... Well, let's talk about gear first. Okay. Our guy. I'm trying to think how many rewatchables we've had with gear. We did we've done Gigolo. <laughs> Gigolo. We did we did uh Pretty Wesley Woman. and I did the Diane Lane affair movie. Unfaithful. We did Pretty Women. Did you do Runaway Bride? No. I don't know if we've done that yet. With some for some reason that you know, everyone's trying to figure out why we haven't done internal affairs yet. I don't know what we're waiting for. I think Christmas Day. It's just <laughs> Did you release your Nice and Rodanthe pod yet? <laughs> Has there ever been a better scene where uh, somebody's riding somebody who's not their husband while on the phone with their husband? <laughs> it's like not camera enough, reveal. Not oh, you're riding film, another no. guy. Oh, okay. Speaking of scummy movies, I re actually rewatched Internal Affairs like a few months ago. Whew. Yeah. yeah. That is, movie's going for it. It, yeah. is, uh, it is immoral. So Gear, one of the weirdest careers where he's, we talked about a little in the Gigolo pod. He's smoking hot. Officer and a gentleman 
now he's like, you know, flames are actually coming off him. Yeah. Yeah. And then he goes into one of the great droughts of all time, which Goldman wrote about when he wrote his essay Mm. about Pretty Woman, where they're just trying to get anyone but Richard Gere. And he's like the 28th choice. A little like how you're going to end up with Robert Covington and... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Terrence Mann, Marcus Morris uh-huh. for James Harden. <laughs> okay. It's like, wow. And then Terrence Mann turns into, you know, a superstar. Um, Is he or Martin Vale, you think? It, yeah. It might be. Terrence Mann. So Gear has internal affairs of Pretty Woman. He's suddenly the hottest, yeah. you know, lead actor other than maybe Costner and Hanks. Um, and then it's another drought after that. Then he has, a, it goes off the rails again for him. I get the impression he's pretty picky and pretty old school movie star and that he's got a lot of thoughts on his character. Like I watched a couple of the making ofs for Primal Fear and it was a lot of interviews with producers but not gear. Mm. And the whole, all their interviews were about here's what Richard wanted, here's what Richard wanted. Yeah, I mean, I think actually he and Norton share that where it sounds yes. like for he may as, have learned it for from as gear. coveted as these roles were and for as like hotly, you know, as a, such a hot property, it sounds like they redid a lot of it in yes. in both in the rehearsals leading up to the movie. So after Pretty Woman, he's in. I mean, this is a pretty rough run. You know the funny thing in this in this period you're de- 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 describing here after Pretty Woman is I remember with Final Analysis and Summers B, he was like a real big premier magazine. Like yeah. it's the summer of Summers B. We can't wait, and it was <laughs> yeah. just be like oh okay, like this. Yeah. This one so that like, one bombed. He was at Mr. Jones and Intersection and First Night. He's basically 0 for 5. The best thing he did was in the in and the band played on, which is one of the best TV movies ever. Mm-hmm. He played the choreographer in that, and he's fucking awesome in that movie. Um, well, C- Craig was asking us before we started, like, is Richard Gere a good actor? Which is an interesting And what was our answer? Well, you said, I think, the truth, which is, like, he's great at being Richard Gere, which for a certain kind of movie... Is what a movie I needs. think he's a good movie star. Yes, exactly. So he's, he's but he's not star. a bad actor. No. You know, he's not like I just think he always plays you know? Richard Gere pretty much. He's got three variations yes. of Richard Gere. Like not in Days of Heaven. He's not right, doing Richard Gere. There's a couple of films where he's doing something different, but for the most part. But he's part, kind of always a smug, beautiful prick. Yes, agree. My favorite Richard Gere is the internal affairs Richard Gere. Like where he just evil, leans in a true Sammy. villain. He kind yeah. of does I that in Breathless too. I prefer Marty to 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 internal as a per like as a character, I guess. Yeah, I, the best Richard Gere character ever was Officer and a Gentleman, though. Yeah, and he's not. I mean, he's Mayo. Very, he's very likable in that movie, though. He he's, is. He's not. But he starts out completely unlikable yeah. and becomes. You know, we'll do that one at some point on this podcast. Um, probably, will, you, will you carry me out of the podcast studio when we do Officer and a Gentleman? I will. <laughs> love will love will lift us up where we belong. Gear as, as a person is you know complicated. Has a lot of thoughts, a lot of political ideas. There's a lot. Of, there's a reason why his star has fallen in the last 25 years but i wonder what it's like to be a movie star where you know that your best character is as chris said a smug beautiful prick like he must have a self-awareness of the fact that he's only getting scripts where that's what people want from him yeah that's so strange well this is what i love about this movie is for as much as this movie obviously hinges on a twist in the performance of norton the movie is memorable because it's a movie star willing to get absolutely fucking dunked on at the mm-hmm. end of the movie. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And m- most movies end with some hint of redemptive heroic act on the part of the lawyer or yes. on the part of the movie star hero. And you always, I always go think back to the Once Upon a Time in Hollywood conversation with the Al Pacino and Leonardo DiCaprio. And he's just like, and then you find out you're getting your ass kicked by this younger guy on TV and you're yeah. the bad guy. And it's like, that's this moment for gear. It's like you and Raheem. But, <laughs> <laughs> but by all accounts, gear was the one who was like, he has to lose. Like he has to lose to Aaron, Roy, whatever. You know yes, what I mean? Like yeah. he has to walk out there and the no last way, shot yeah. needs to be this guy has been decapitated. So Norton talks about this in one of the interviews. Norton gave a lot of interviews about this I think movie. he did a ton of interviews around Motherless Brooklyn where he yeah. did like long pod interviews about Including his career. career. I was yeah. more excited about it until he went on 27 other pods. Yeah. Then it felt a little less He was special. on mine as well, Bill. Sorry. Um, <laughs> right. He was on the Philly special too. But he said, um, <laughs> he said the ending, the ideas were as bad that he should punch out the kid. You should realize he's going to nail him. You should have a recorder on him, be busting him, all these things. And all this was like this terror. And Norton said, Richard was the one who really stood firm, almost to the point of refusing to do anything else. He was like, did anybody just see what we did here? He was kind of pointing at me. And he was like, this is how you use me to the best effect. I'm slick. It's a body blow. 
the last shot of the movie is me standing with my shoulders sagging, punched in the face. That's it. Oh, I do love that last shot. It's yeah. A great last and shot. Norton said, this, he's like, this is not, I need to come out on top. I need to win my character. And that's why yeah, we made the I movie. I think right. that if this is Tom Cruise, I think Tom Cruise needs to win. You know? I think like he walks out and Tom it turns Hanks, out he has a recorder. I think Tom Hanks needs to be like, I will give up my career in the law and break attorney client privilege for this to, to like put this guy away, you know? It's not, that's not what Gear does here. You know what's interesting though is that most of these movies in this era do have these kind of bummer endings. You know, mo- th- there are Cruise movies where you feel like, yeah. you know, he, he over- overcomes, but even at the end of The Firm, it's like, you know, their family's almost destroyed. And like yeah, but he's survive, still a lawyer, he's and he's lawyer. and he and he beats the mob, and he beats the. Firm. Except yeah. the mob kills him ten minutes after the movie ends. It's a good <laughs> it's very, it's very, very, very strong point. It's a deleted scene. Yep. David Strathairn is cut to pieces. <laughs> so you think if Gear was in Castaway, he he he, <laughs> he ends up like he has no redemption at the at the four corners at the end. He no, just, he's standing outside Helen Hunt's house, just, just like fuck. And then the police comes and arrests him, and yeah. then that's the end of the movie. Ed Norton, this is a famous young actor movie that Damon talked about on my podcast once about how everyone wanted this part. They auditioned 2,100 people for it, and it was like one of the parts. It's funny, like that era where you had all these this great class of actors, and there were like the school, t- school ties parts, the scent of a woman part. There was this part. Like there was a couple of them, but this was like the big part. And Ed Norton says... He found out about it from his friend, Connie Britton. Yeah. Your queen. She was going for the more Sean Fantasy's Queen Elizabeth. I can't imagine knowing Connie Britton at 20 years old. That must have been really exciting. I can't believe he acted. I just would have just been following her around. The reason she told him about Primal Fear is because one day, like, they were neighbors in New York, and she was like, I have this audition for an indie movie, but I don't know if I'm going to go. And he's like, no, you should go do it. You should go be in a feature film. Like, you should go do movies. And it was Brothers McMullen. And so she does Brothers McMullen and she gets brother and she like gets a little bit of juice going. And then down the line, she's going for the more tyranny part in Primal Fear. And she's like, you should really read for this. Yeah, she says, she tells Ed Norton, they're seeing people for this role and I have the spookiest feeling it's made for you. Almost how Connie Britton was made for Sean and Brothers McMullen as the it's, peak of anything he ever wanted. I'm trying to not say too much, honestly. It's, like, it's a little painful for me. <laughs> when to you think saw about. that movie, did your like brain explode? Well, you can imagine on Long Island, it was treated like we finally had our mean streets. You know, yeah. we were like, thank God yeah. someone has Someone's decided here. to put the Irish American experience on screen <laughs> on Long Island. <laughs> Uh, I actually always thought it was a little overrated. And I loved, related to this movie, I always loved She's the One. That's a yeah. movie that I dug a lot. Yeah. Which is That's on our rewatch. The same list. year that this was released and also stars John Mahoney. Yeah. And has the all-time smoke show cast that anyone's ever assembled in a movie. That's to talk about that when we do the pod. Norton said, comes in, in his audition, he, he uh, gives the guy the stammer, the stutter. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm as a way to make him stand out. And uh, apparently... In case you couldn't tell, they needed to name the character Aaron Stampler. Like, <laughs> all right, guys. <laughs> he stammers. We get it. He said uh, the audition tape had so much notoriety that it got him cast in other movies. He got cast in a Woody Allen movie and he got cast in The People vs. Larry Flint, L- Larry Flint before the movie uh, Primal Fair even opened. This is what Ed Norton says. People made a big deal out of that. It was sort of like the Nirvana demo tape. My screen tests on Elite it. Elite quote. Yeah. It went around and I was that's like, what, why uh, is everybody seeing this? Why am I hearing about people seeing it at parties in Hollywood and shit like that? That's what I said. What a fucking flex. I about, about the Hollywood Perspectives pod. You yeah. can't really hear it anymore, but it's kind of like the Nirvana demo tape that's floating around out there. See, our, yeah, Craig, you should do this with the first fantasy football pod. <laughs> people are like, yeah, people in the fantasy football yeah. community, they knew about the, yeah. the pilot episode yeah. we did. The demo tape episode. It's a good concept. But this turns into the, <laughs> the Nirvana demo tape. <laughs> this turns into like, the Ken Griffey Jr. upper deck rookie card of oh, like yeah. modern acting. It's like, he's, oh, uh, he's I, just like, I don't want to get ahead of SAS or any of the other categories, but I mean, very strong possibility that barring maybe like Orson Welles and Citizen Kane, that this is the great announcement first part yeah. for a movie actor. And the thing like you're saying is that he, because of the way things worked back then, he basically <sighs> comes out of, 
absolute nowhere. And there's some really interesting journalism about Norton at the time where he's like intentionally obscuring his biography and like facts about his life and talking yeah. about himself too much so that kind of some mythology starts to build up around him. And because of that tape, he winds up getting cast in these movies so that within two years, he's in five of like the most have important the movies or whatever. And you're just like, oh, I guess this guy is just like the actor of his generation all yep. of a sudden. That was how I felt when I was a teenager. I was like, this is my guy. This is at this turn in my life in 1996, 14 is when I'm going movie crazy. I'm reading every magazine. I'm, I'm like, oh my God, a new Milos Forman movie at yeah. 14. And this is the person I identified as like my Pacino, my De Niro. I, he didn't totally become that, but but you could make the case at that time. It was obvious that he, it seemed like he was going to be. His first four years are incredible. Everyone Says I Love You came out, I guess, before Primal Fear. Is that possible? I don't think so. I th- so I am to be screwed this up because Primal Fear, Everyone Says I Love You, The People vs. Larry Flint, American History X, Rounders, Fight Club. <laughs> Have we done, we did Fight Club, Rounders, It's like John Cazale is the greatest IMDb of all time. This is probably the greatest start to an IMDb just from a rewatchable standpoint. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, everyone says I love you isn't good. No, he's Uh, he's five for six. But he's he's in a Woody Allen movie. movie. Yeah. Yeah, Yeah, which is crazy. He went from not acting at all to like, hey, Woody, where do you want me to stand? Yeah. Right. And he's, I mean, he's nominated for his first role. Nowadays... He's in two of those movies, and they're throwing a suit on him, like a like a superhero suit. You mean? Yeah, he put a yeah. suit on eventually. He was the Hulk, and that was kind of when things flipped a little bit for him. I think what happened to his career is an interesting conversation. I don't know if it's it's one we. I think. He, I mean, he, he's one person who I think probably is been both propped up. I think that, that what he does for the material that he does, like when he's in. 25th hour or whatever and the things he brings to these movies are st- it's still amazing on a pretty regular basis no doubt but it does sound like if you're going to do a movie with edward norton you're going to get the full edward norton experience and he's going to want to be very deeply involved with like the writing the editing the whatever you know except he still does he has a small part in the new wes anderson movie and he's awesome yeah he's, but like, he's he's kind of like a tennessee williams kind of character but he's only in three scenes right he's and, like that in budapest i mean he's like yeah. he's like great and I feel like his last 20 years should have been more impactful. And I'm not really positive what happened. Because you go you go in the 2000s, he's keeping the faith, the score, Death to Smoochie, Frida, Red Dragon. But then he's in 25th Hour and he's fucking amazing in that movie. Yeah. And, and then like that, I would say that's probably his best performance, right? That or American History X. Or Fight Club. Um, I mean, he, the next year he's one of the stars of The Italian Job, which is a huge hit. So it's it's still it's still moving for him. Even a few years later, The Illusionist, you know, made by friends of ours, really good movie. I think it's really more like Down in the Valley and The Painted Veil and these movies where he starts getting more involved, as Chris is saying, and he starts having a bigger idea as a producer, and he wants to be a writer director. At a he certain might not point. have cared too. I I think one of the things with him is he had a distinctive face, mm-hmm. and I wonder like. Uh, you know, somebody like Nicholson had a distinctive mm-hmm. face, but I, maybe it just gets harder to work over and over again. He's really good in Birdman. He always, he'd pop up. He's really good in Born Legacy. Like he, yeah, he, he just, pops up every couple of years yeah. and like, wow, that guy's fucking really good. I forgot. Yeah, he jumps off the screen. He's an amazing actor. He's, but he's like a 70s actor, like you said. You know, he likes to transform a little bit. He likes to take on complicated mm-hmm. character parts. Hollywood's not really as welcoming towards those kinds of roles. There's a reason he only basically works now with like, Wes Anderson, Ina Ritu. Like, he works with a very short list of people that he feels comfortable with. He did get nominated, like, seven years ago for an Oscar. It's not like he hasn't done anything. Would you rather have Matt Damon's career or Ed Norton's career? I would rather have Ed Norton's because I think Ed Norton is, like, considered a like a, a greater actor. But it's interesting but... to consider the two of them. I mean, Matt Damon had the benefit of having a franchise in Bourne that basically he could always return to for the course of a decade. Matt Damon's been way more successful. And yeah, I mean, Matt Damon's been much more successful. What's interesting about the later part of Ed Norton's career is he never had like that he's against Leo in The Departed kind of role. He's come close a couple times. Like Birdman, it felt like Birdman was going to be the absolute biggest movie. movie. And we were doing Greatland that year. Mm -hmm. It just felt like that was going to win every Oscar and be the biggest movie of the year. And then something kind of 
flipped with it where it didn't do quite as well as everybody thought it was going to do. It did, Keaton, though. But Keaton mean, didn't win Best Actor. Yeah, yeah. Like, it felt but, like it was going to be like Silence of the Lambs winning Right, everything. right, right. That's true. It, didn't totally get there. But it won Best Picture, made $100 yeah. million. Dollars. The critics loved it. And he was nominated, you know, all that. All, all really not that rewatchable. I was not a huge fan at the time. Yeah. It's like a, a fun one time experience, but I wouldn't watch it like. It's a cool parlor trick. Seven, eight times. It's so funny though, when you look back, he plays Aaron slash Roy. He plays Derek in American History X. He plays Worm in Rounders mm -hmm. and he plays the Fight Club guy. So four like really distinct, different characters. They're iconic. That we we st and we, we're still talking about those first four roles today. You know what I mean? Like it's it's there's a fucking Rounders poster in the bear. Like yeah. is it's like he yeah. is he in sort sort of well, like there's not just a Rounders poster. They take the closing credits yeah. song for season two and got it back on Spotify. So kudos <laughs> to those fucking guys. <laughs> so that's a great song. Um, that was the most excited text message I've gotten from you. And uh, I couldn't believe it. I thought, I thought you were gonna be more fired gone. up for Bruce Hornsby to be honest. That that's the song that opens. The yeah, season. yeah, yeah. I got gotcha. you. Yeah. All right. We haven't really talked stuff. about the bear. We haven't. And I, I don't feel like I'm on your bear text. I'm, it's I, like <laughs> you and Greenwald and somebody else. <laughs> Whatever. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Wait, hold on. I don't. I'm not sure if we should move on from that. <laughs> Whatever, man. Whatever it's, simmering. It's got, it's got two, some cool bear text going on. <laughs> These are the, I'm with the two premier TV podcasters of their era here, you know, and there's a little bit of a cold war going on. And I, I didn't do anything. Whatever, man. <laughs> I actually don't. I don't have a bear text, Bill. If it was, if we had a bear text, you'd be on it. All right. <laughs> Norton gets nominated. That. I don't want Roy to come out. You know. <laughs> Shut the fuck up. Uh, Norton gets nominated for this movie. Along with James Woods and Ghost of Mississippi. Yeah. Wow. Byron De La Beckwith. That was your favorite performance of the year, right? <laughs> yeah. Armin Mueller Star and Shine. Armin Mueller Star. Armin Mueller Star. Yeah. Stahl. Where are you uh, getting an R? <laughs> Armin Mueller Stahl. 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 Yeah. He played uh, Jeffrey Rush's father in Shine. Shine. Get that movie the fuck out of here. Um, <laughs> Macy and Fargo. I'm great signing off on that. Yeah. yeah. And then Cuba Gooding Jr. wins for Jerry Maguire, which I'm okay with all these years yeah, later. I love Rod Tidwell. Rod yeah. Tidwell was an amazing yeah, character. Great character. Great performance. Awesome Oscar. So I'm okay with it. Yeah. I thought I'd be madder when I, when, because I think Norton's I, amazing I thought in the this same movie. thing. When I cracked it open, I was like, what? I can't wait to see this bullshit. And I was like, oh yeah, these are largely pretty good, you know? I think we yeah. talked about it on the Maguire pod. I, you can make a case Rod Tidwell is the greatest sports movie character of all time. Yeah. He's in the running. The problem with that whole situation is that you know, Jeffrey Rush wins for Shine, and that's Cruz's Oscar. Like that's a that's right. an that's an anomaly. That's why I hate moment. Shine. That's yeah. why we don't acknowledge it in the rewatchables. Yeah. Fuck off, Shine. <laughs> this movie has a ridiculous cast, including Laura Linney, Andre Brower, Frances McDormand. Might have won a couple Oscars <laughs> later in her career. This year, yes, she's in Fargo. She's in Fargo this year. And she's just like a shrink in this movie. Maura Tierney. Love Maura Tierney. Went on a date with her sister once. What? Yeah. <laughs> what? Terry O'Quinn. Hey, wait a second. <laughs> hey, wow. How'd it go? Uh, Ra Rob Mahoney. Oh, no, that's John <laughs> You're Mahoney. You're blowing past every good moment. Come here. on. You're like, Alfre Woodward. <laughs> Did you Alfred go on a Woodward. date with Alfre Woodward's sister, too? Where are we getting this? That would have been great. I would have loved that. <laughs> I went on one date. I took her to the Celtics game, and of course, I'm. Mean, this is incredible. At I mean, halftime, she got up. She thought the game was over, and I was like, "This probably is not going to make it." She's very cool, though. Was it Deirdre? Yeah, Deirdre Tierney. Yeah. I went on one date with her. Did, where did, did wow. you? What, did she come into the bar or something? Like, how'd you meet her? Can't remember. Okay, don't really remember a lot from the nineties. What could have been? You could have been on the set of news radio. When was this? Was she like my sister? Mora is going to be in this private so, fear was, movie. Mora was already famous at okay. that point. Uh, interesting. $30 million budget made $102 million. Primal Fear. Pretty sick. That's how we used to, how we used to roll. Used to be a great country. Our guy Raj, 3.5 stars. Way to go, fucking Ebert. He's Let's killing go. it. This plot is as good as crime procedurals get, but the movie is really better than its plot because of the three-dimensional characters. He loves plot and three-dimensional characters. So th that review is really interesting because he th throws all this praise on gear but it's a real relic of newspaper writing because he's trying really hard to not give away the end of the movie, how good Norton is yeah. and, and what the ending is yeah. in, in his review. And it's like, you know, it's service it's, journalism. It's, it's you know? also, I, it's kind of, this was a huge word of mouth movie 
because when you just see the like marketing materials and the post, first of all, the posters just gear standing alone. The marketing materials, I think, largely like obscure a lot. Well, especially the twist at the end, but it was like it was. I remember this being like, you've got to go see this kid in this movie kind of thing. Here's the oh, ta- yeah. the tagline of the movie is, sooner or later, a man who wears two faces forgets which one is real. But that's on the poster with gear. And you think that that's about gear. Yeah, it's about it's him not. being shallow. Well, and by playing. the way, it is about gear. It is about gear. It is. It is about gear. That's, that's one of the true. cool things about this movie is both people are two personalities. Yeah. I don't really know which person. Gear kind of settles into the second personality by the end, but the first personality is the fucking asshole talking to the reporter right. and arrogant yeah. guy who's banging the lawyer and just is just not a good guy. I think or he's- John Mahoney puts it balling her. Balling. Yeah. <laughs> by the last time balling was used in a movie, I think. You have a little bit of like older man John from Mahoney Chicago guy. energy. Pick up your little handbag, <laughs> destroy the tape. You cocksucker. <laughs> <laughs> Most rewatchable scene. Um, I think the opening credits into the big banquet scene is really good. Yeah. Great scene setter. Also, and just Ed up, Norton's up, in the Chicago. boys' choir, which, yeah. you know, they kind of stick that in. We have Laura Linney honking on her first cigarette. We have, it was a one night stand, Marty. It just lasted six months. Great line. Good writing. Mm-hmm. Uh, everything just sets up everything. He's walking around like a smug little asshole. He thinks yeah. he's going to bring her home that night. And he's like, I'm king of the city. I can yeah. stroll into this benefit late. I can shake hands with the monster standing in front of a yeah, table. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, the post-murder scene chase is pretty solid. It's some, cool. Some helicopter shots here. Yeah. This yeah. movie's not afraid to dive into the helicopter shots. <laughs> it's not. It likes it every likes twenty overhead. minutes. It's yeah. like, hey, let's let's go above again. It's very um, unfussy and unsophisticated in a good way. And like Hoblet, the director is just made a lot of TV. NYPD Blue yeah. has oh, yeah. a lot of yeah. scene elsewhere and just like that scene feels NYPD it Blue-ish. Does. Yes. It does. The, the chase in particular the apprehending the suspect thing where it's like almost like documentary style like a helicopter yeah. shot overhead. I don't know. It's it's like a very simple style of filmmaking that's perfect for movies like this. I love I was going to have this later. I'll do it now. I love when there's a chase scene in the train and somebody has to run in front of the train and then the, everybody the else has to wait looking yeah. under the train and it just I always think like this is you could get away this way. Like what do you, the move is to hop on the train from being the other completely side. covered in the archbishop's blood is a an a, it's tough a hurdle. Yeah. yeah, it's tough. But he should have jumped on the train. Uh, it was they going pretty him. fast. Make a move. <laughs> just, you did, just, but did Aaron want to get caught? Yeah, that's the, we're gonna get. Did to he want to get caught? Is really the question. Yeah, there. good point. I just wrote down. I don't have any of these as a rewatchable scene, but I really like the gear versus Linny scenes. I just think they're yeah. There's they're, a couple of like a couple really good recurring ones. scenes. Yeah, it's like the McDormand Norton interviews mm-hmm. go there. They get sprinkled. All throughout. that stuff's good. I don't and all the Linny scenes. Can I can I throw another one? Yeah, that's a courtroom movie trope that I love. Is the main lawyer briefing his two underlings on like the case, and they're like, "You got to be kidding me! How are we gonna win this?" <laughs> he's like, "We're gonna win," you know. <laughs> right. So when he's like, he's telling Tommy and Naomi about. He's covered in his blood. Like, he's got the archbishop's ring in his pocket. And he goes, I didn't say that. I said he had the archbishop's ring in his pocket. You know, like, he's yeah, like, yeah. He, he's like, he stole the archbishop's ring. He's like, I didn't say that. I said he had it in his pocket. You know, like, you you're right. The it, briefing of the case is I a love great it. trope. Everybody's Good writing shit CR. down on legal pads. But doesn't that remind you a little bit of being called into Bill's office? And he's like, I got an idea. We're bringing in Brian Barrett off the pike. <laughs> and I pull <laughs> and out we're a like, legal, what? You're going to do what? Pad. A Boston pod? <laughs> and Jeff's like, we can't make these numbers work. <laughs> <laughs> I do have. There's a bunch of McDormand Aaron scenes, but I do like when she rattles him. Because I like what Norton does, that face he makes for a split second. Where yeah. it's like, oh, yeah. what's going like, on Who here? Who the fuck do you think you're talking yeah. to? Yeah. yeah. I wrote down, they find the sex tape. So related to that, I think one of my favorite scenes in the movie is when Lenny goes to meet Gear at the bar late at night. Yeah. And, and they have that confrontation, which is like you said, it's part of this like three or four sequences. Yes. It's just the two of them talking. Ple- that one in particular. Ple- That's the best one of She's all the so scenes. so good in yeah. that scene. Yeah. She's really, I mean, this is like a big announcement for her. She'd been in other movies, but you could see she was going to be around for a long time after a couple of those scenes. Well, you know, when what scene put her on the map? Shortcuts. My son is better at this <laughs> than anything you've ever been at in your whole life. <laughs> That's true. Yeah. Yeah. She was a teacher. Um, Aaron turns into Roy 
not nothing. It's like, what's going on here? I like Brower on the stand. Just where do your Andre Brower thoughts? Like, is did you ever see him in anything and be like, oh no, he's in this movie? No, he's like he's always he's batting a thousand. Like, Pushing the like, he's almost always gonna like eat some other person's lunch. Like it's real close. I love that guy in this movie where like when he's like, "Fuck Marty, you want my job?" Like <laughs> it's like, "Oh shit!" Like Andre Brower, Richard Gere going head to head. We that's did, that's one of those when they talk about the, the all the kind of racism and all the weird shit that was going on in the eighties and nineties was. Like that's a guy you just point to and be like, "That guy should have had a bigger career. He should have been more famous." But he, I mean, wow. he is like. I get it. He's uh, on homicide. He is like I get it. He's the, homicide. Like, like one of the great saying, acting performances. When did we have this conversation where we were like Pembleton is up there with all of the like bad men of the two thousands yeah. in TV shows? Like one of the most riveting yeah. TV characters. Some you could not you to take your eyes yeah. off him. The, the, when that the show homicide was interrogation scene. Like watch that. That's like it's one of my dad's all time favorite. Shows. Shows. You can't watch when it. did we ha- we did we did have this conversation right once before? Where we were like, how is this guy not one of There's the a actors? A bunch of, this generation? of those dudes from that. That's why even somebody like in this generation, Courtney like Vance like, was like that for a while too. I mean, he kind of went. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, like Idris Elba, who I think has had a really good career and gotten a lot of chances. I think if he comes along twenty years earlier, he's just kind of bouncing around because that's what happened back then. Yeah, there weren't yeah. like even I was going to talk about this later, but you know, one of the courtroom tropes is the judge is always black. Like almost always, it's yeah. like 85, 90% of the time, because that was a way to kind of shove mm-hmm. some sort of black actor into the cast so you could have more diversity. And it's embarrassing. Like yeah. nowadays, like either either Laura Linney, John Mahoney, or Gear, one of those parts isn't a white person. Like they just would have been more thoughtful oh, of about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think the although we did get Manny from Scarface, which was great. Alfred Woodard is also great in this movie, though. Like I she wouldn't, is. I wouldn't, yeah. I definitely wouldn't trade her for anybody, yeah. but. The Brower thing is weird because it feels like he should have been an Academy Award nominated actor, but he was on Homicide for like eight years and then he was on Brooklyn Nine-Nine for like five years. So ultimately, he had a huge career. Like he had a really big successful career for an actor, but... He did, but he... he, he, I think he was first in Glory. Yeah. So it's like if you look at the... through, Through Glory... So it's like Denzel goes up like this in Glory. Even Morgan Freeman gets more famous after Glory. And he doesn't ever, he doesn't quite get to where they went. I would have liked to have seen him in more stuff like how Yafa Koto was used in Midnight Run, mm. where you're almost using what people's expectations of what he's going to be against. That's what Brooklyn Nine-Nine is. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, but that took, yeah. that wasn't until 2000, yeah, he was yeah. like, in like 15. His 60s. Yeah, yeah. I like that guy. Uh, Chris's guy, Mahoney, on the stand. <laughs> you little cocksucker. Start looking for a job. That's another. That's another. <laughs> Terry game. O'Quinn. Yeah. There. Um. But that that whole gear using Manny's death. Yeah. To just be like, that's I'm going Joey rogue Canero. at Mahoney. Yeah, yeah I love that. That's great. Um. Can I also throw another Mahoney moment in? Yeah. Shaughnessy eating Chinese food and describing how the city works, and he's like, the pipes are bursting again, John. <laughs> but just any any like major municipal meeting taking place in a Chinese restaurant. You know, I love it. He's eating the little egg noodle. Has that guy ever actually been a nice guy in a movie? Mahoney? He's no, great. no, no, not Mahoney. I'm saying that character, the guy oh, who knows the no. whole the city, the attorney, attorney who runs that, everything. Like, oh, there's a hundred percent chance this guy's a huge scumbag. Yeah, yeah. No, he, he's never like, hey, man, I got to wrap this up. I'm I'm coaching a special Olympics team <laughs> in two hours, and then afterwards, I'm gonna go rehab a building. So I'll see. I'll see you on Monday. Yeah, it's kind of the inverse of the lawyer is a great part for a movie star, like high-end politician is always kind of a scumbag. It's good. I, it's a little... I have thoughts on Mahoney later. Aaron slash Roy in the stand. The choke scene. It's really good. Yeah. You know it's coming. I think... Then it happens. I have some questions about Linny's mind... character's mind state during that cross-examination so i had that in what stage the worst when she's like i would kill him yeah i would rip his eyes out it's like would you like are you gonna say that in a crowded courtroom it's yeah, a little weird she lost the plot a little bit yeah wasn't great yeah i like Sorry, the fact Chris. that that it's okay the, there's i think pretty much at like the final courtroom scene starts at 30 minutes left and there's not a dull second for the last 30 minutes of this movie no 
Yeah, I think the last, last 40 I, minutes of this movie is yeah. just lights out. Yeah. I was going to say that it takes a while to get yeah. into the courtroom. Whatever but it once is, we're there, we're yeah, there a but when, lot. When he, puts, when he puts Aaron on the stand and he's like covering the microphone and he's like, you little bitch, whatever he says to him. And then like he gets, and then he sets Lenny up to do yep. it. And then last one, which is the winner, is the big reveal. Good for you, Marty. There never was an Aaron counselor. It was like, we were dancing, Marty. <laughs> we're a great team. So good. You can't, you, know, you can't, you cannot underestimate what a mind blower it was when you saw the movie because there, there's a critical scene right before that scene, which is they go in Alfred Woodard's chambers and they decide what the fate of the trial is going to be. She's going to throw the case out. He's going to get reprimanded, remanded to the mental institution. He has that moment where he hugs her from behind. Yeah. And he wants to dance with her. Mm -hmm. And then the movie kind of like, depressurizes and you're like okay well you're, Aaron I, and Roy he's he had he has yeah. split personality disorder like maybe there'll be one more conclusive moment where he says goodbye to Aaron or whatever there was for me at least as a teenager there was no level of expectation that there was going to be revelation there's also a long it's a weird the I remember watching it early on and being like there's this weird beat as he's leaving the cell where you're like, okay, the, now the music should start and he should walk out and somebody, like maybe that reporter walks up to him and be like, what did you learn, Mr. Vale? Yes. Or yeah. something like that. And I'm like, wow, this, this is going on for like five extra seconds. Yes. When's the music going to come in? And then he's like, oh yeah, tell Janet, like, I'm sorry about the neck. And he stops, you know, and it's like, oh, And when shit. he stops, you're like, oh, fuck. This is so <laughs> great. And, this was kind of so the well. best era for these. Uh, twists. Oh my God, twists. Yeah. It starts with Crying Game. Then goes through usual suspects, basically. yeah, yeah. Up, up until the sixth sense, yeah. yeah, all the way through sixth sense and Blair Witch, yeah. But when we could still keep secrets, although I did ruin <laughs> usual suspects for Jack O, I'm still really proud of that. He's been a dick, <laughs> he deserved it. Wow, um, yeah, this is the big thing, and also like a great Norton performance in that scene, brilliant. Yeah. It's just really, really great. Like, I was thinking of other actors during this era, and we'll talk about the casting what ifs, but I, I think this is the right guy for yeah, this spot, definitely. What stage the best, horny evil priests. I mean, yeah. it's definitely in the zeitgeist now. That's sure. Yeah, sure. I just want to see how uncomfortable Sierra could get. How about priest sex <laughs> scandal? Priest Wait, sex have I missed scandal. Some news stories or what's going on? Priest sex scandal covers cover ups. They were ahead of their time. Yeah. Private fear, like five years ahead. I like when the cardinal, when he's at the banquet, and it's about the scenes about ten. He goes, "I haven't seen this many lawyers gather in one place since confession this morning." <laughs> And there's like this <laughs> nothing like some good, some good archbishop humor. This is great. Yeah. I could I could have gone three more minutes with yeah. the cardinal cracking one liners. <laughs> Manny from Scarface. Just always love this guy. What's your relationship with Manny? Uh, I mean, from Scarface or that actor Stephen Bauer? Just the actor. Oh, he's he's just a great character actor. You know, I love him. Thief of Hearts. Mm-hmm. Fucking lights out. Yeah. Mid 80s movie. Lights out. I love the line in this movie where he's just like, I had my first kiss in that building. I also got her pregnant. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> yeah. I like a part where, you know, Gear goes into the bar and he hears the song that he likes. And then on the way out, after he's told Panera what the deal is going to be, he gives, he gives him, the, him the, CD. the CD and he's like, See this? That song you like? Fourth cut. <laughs> and then he's and listening the to it that night. Yeah. He, he's unhinged and running scared. Yes. Yes. Yeah, yeah. He never really, never really totally made it. Went up. He was a De Palma guy. He's in a bunch of De Palma. I have movies. some questions because it, it is the eighties where he you Latin? just gotta like wonder what's going on. Is Stephen Bauer actually like a Latin guy? I believe. I thought he was. So. Okay, yeah. Cuban. He's okay. Cuban. I love Stephen Bauer. He's my guy. He's like too handsome to be the eighth lead, but not handsome enough to be gear. You know, like he's in a he's in a middle ground. Like, quite often I just sit on the deck and think about how Miami Vice should have gone, like, for four more years. Mm -hmm. You know, they just kept all the five cast members together. They never innovated. They never added nothing. But Did he like, ever show up on Vice? He should have just been on Vice for, like, I wish I could just go in a time machine and just be like, here are my ideas. Here's how we can keep this going. He should have been, like, this kind of, like, cop slash... Dirty Bauer? on the dirty side, and it yeah. should have been the whole season of them trying to figure out. I think it, who's inside. Like he just should have been on that. So show. you would have you would have wanted Miami Vice. What if I told you like Vice could have gone for five more seasons, but they have to replace Crockett like they did with Caruso? No, you keep Crockett and Tubbs. You replace everyone else okay. around them. The key is that everyone else around them. That's what Cheers figured out. That's why Cheers was on eleven years. 
They kept adding characters. He eventually showed up on Breaking Bad and Saul. Mm -hmm. Bauer. I he was good. Bellatio. Laura Linney and Maura Tierney. Yes. A lot of history with these two at this point. I mean, this like basically jump starts a three decade Laura Linney career. Maura Tierney's, you know, she's in Liar Liar the next year. She had a really That's good right. career. Yeah. Then peaks in the affair. I think I first... One of the craziest cable shows Tierney of all was on time. ER for a while, right? Oh, yeah. yeah. A while. Yeah. She's good in ER, too. Yeah, after, after news radio. Uh, I think the first time I saw Laura Linney was in Congo. I see Congo, mm -hmm. 1995. Terrible film. I loved it. Great. New England New England legend. Yeah. Every guy in the East Coast. Kind of kind of got a lot her. of her dap from, from Ozark the last couple of years. <laughs> That's true. Did you did you do do the, the Hoblet research where he was like, this is my gal? I need a stage actress for this part. Laura Linney. I was talking about Tierney. Courtroom. Oh, yeah. Linney. Yeah. yeah. Well, she, what happens to her after this? It's a, when is the, when is, uh, you can count, you can on, count me. on me. That's four years later. Yeah. That's when, when that's that what, happens. That was like Ruffalo's big, big day. Well, she was in Truman Show like the next year and she, she plays Carrie's wife in Truman Show. She's really good in Truman Show. You can Show. count on me as like this person is going to be in our lives yeah. now. For in fact, I would say years. you can count on me as not altogether dissimilar from the, like Ruffalo's announcement and you can count on me as not on like Primal Fear. Right. I got to come up with a theme month. Where it would make sense to do, you can count on me. Lenny month? Or like, uh, yeah. fucked up sibling yeah, month? Yeah, emotionally destroyed Kenneth month. Kenneth Lonergan yeah. month, you could do Manchester by the Sea. Lonergan month, oh my God. <laughs> Mar Margaret, should we do Margaret? Yeah. Sponsored yeah. by BetterHelp. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> the, uh, so Damon said he chased the world desperately. And... This is, I have this as a what's age the best. After he didn't get this part, that's what led to him and Affleck writing Goodwill Hunting. Probably the, creating Goodwill Hunting. All the like guy, because Damon and Norton, and, and to their credit, like Affleck, all these guys have gotten really good at being like, hey, this was 20, 30 years ago. So like, let's talk about like who was up for what yeah. role. Mm -hmm. And Norton has this whole thing with Sam, who did the Isbell doc, mm -hmm. uh, where he talked about he was up for Rainmaker. He met with Coppola. Damon was also up for Raymaker. Damon, like, I, I don't remember exactly the chronology, but essentially, like, Coppola was like, you know, it seems like you're kind of into this, but it also seems like you really want to do American History X. You should make American History X. And so Norton did that, and Damon got Paves Rainmaker. The There's yeah. a lot of paved the way yeah. for this guy to do. But it's like, if, if Norton gets Rainmaker, does he make American History X? You know, like... It's not quite on the level of Aaron Sampler, but Damon this year does get one of those parts because this is the Courage Under yeah. Fire year too he where he has that critical scene the heroin the scene yeah. yeah where he's recovering I mean, CR lost 40 pounds to get a job at Grantland I know he's a total method actor he wanted us to be <laughs> look great he yeah. thought it was a hipster site so he just wanted to lose a ton of weight <laughs> see if it would work um what else do you have for what's age the best oh uh, I have a couple of things one is th there's one last uh courtroom trope that I wanted to, to shout out <laughs> I'm going to call this pulling an Airman O'Malley oh. in uh, A Few Good Men where he's like, Airman O'Malley's in the court audience and yeah. then everybody who's Love on it. the other side is like, why the fuck is this guy here? Yeah. And it's when Marty has the victim of the archbishop sexual abuse who had filed the complaint against Shaughnessy and Shaughnessy's like looking over at him and he's like, what, why is this guy here? You know, this is like a surprise witness. Uh, I also just think the Nathaniel Hawthorne quote really works yeah. for multiple mm -hmm. characters in this. And uh, the last shot, one of all-time last shots. There's a good story that I like that aged well, which is that Gear felt like the script was really missing something. It's an adaptation of a novel by William Deal. Um, and I think it was Steve Shagan who had originally adapted yeah, and it. and Anne Biederman. And, and Gear is like, we need Anne Biederman on this movie. And she had just written three or four episodes of NYPD Blue. And then she goes on to create Southland which is an amazing show that was on TNT for a long time and then she also did um, Ray Donovan that was like the last show that she created and she's gone on to be like a big TV writer and producer but you can tell that she is someone who like her script clicks the movie into place mm -hmm. yeah. so identifying her kind of before she blows up you have any would say your best that was that was my one I'm moving on then the Kid Cudi Pursuit of Happiness Award for Best Needle Drop I don't have one there's well, no the, the Stephen Bauer the, the track that he's like track for you know, yeah, okay. That sure. song, I think, went on to become the theme song to Southland. There you go. Big Kahuna Burger Award, best use of food and drink, the Chinese food. Yeah. Mm, yeah. Den of Thieves, Benny Hanna Award, scene still in location. This is easy. Barley corns. The bar girl that they go to like four times in this, in this movie. And it's like, when did we stop as a country where you were like, it's lunch, I'm going to have a 
a cheeseburger and a martini for lunch. <laughs> I love how the, the ease with which she says it on the phone. Where she's like, barley corns, 10 minutes. You yeah. know, like she wants them there immediately. Barley corns a real place? Uh, I don't know. I should have looked this barley up. Barley corns in Chicago? Great Shot Gordo Award, most cinematic shot. Train tracks? Last shot. Last shot? Yeah. Yeah, last shot. I like the also the overhead shot of Norton when he's lit, sleeping in bed and there's like cross cutting between all the characters talking about him. Mm. It was real, but it's now closed. Okay. Oh, okay. Vincent Chase Award. Are we sure this character was actually good at his job? <laughs> Shaughnessy, what's going on? <laughs> Not a very good conspiratorial politician. Jesus. Yeah. Your name's just on LLCs? Yeah. Like, what the fuck you are you doing? You guys gotta get into the Caymans. Start, start getting some shell corpse also, going. Also, how does he not know Janet Venable is a little bit of a rogue agent here and that she wouldn't follow orders on, this, right. on running this case? Yeah, it's one of those weird, like, we've, We've selected you because you used to be with this guy. So obviously, like, it'll just be like you'll steamroll him. It's like, no. The Matlet Rubin Award. Did this movie need a better sex scene? I could have gone for a little bit. Could have gone. Gary and Lenny yeah. could have taken a bath together or something. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> Get a shower. What do you mean? The sauna. Janet, you seem so dirty. <laughs> Janet. Come on, let's, let's take a take bath. Take a shower. Yeah. <laughs> Did you get a chance know. to watch the homemade porno? What a. <laughs> <laughs> I Something guess that could happen that with those is a two. sex scene, the, the, the homemade porno that we see. Yeah, we could use a better one. That's, That's true. a disturbing That's true. sex scene. Yeah. I, don't, I don't like the cardinal <laughs> narrating. <laughs> no, from behind. There's a take a minute. <laughs> it's <laughs> fucking disturbing. <laughs> the Butch's Girlfriend Award, weak link of the film. I don't know if you guys noticed this, but the, the reporter's in like four scenes. Yeah. And he's a fucking zero. Connorman? Like, is he's that his just name? a zero. Yeah. It's almost, he's like basically a propped up corpse. What also doesn't make any sense <laughs> I, don't, is, I don't understand it. He is- Reg Rogers. Like Marty keeps having him around after the cover story has come out. And right. like he's just like, Connor, meet every, me at the bar. Every like, part of him is terrible. Like, first of all, like if we're recasting that, who who would you want as the reporter? Hmm, like, would Olivier it be somebody probably. who seems yeah. a little, <laughs> yeah. no, but would it be somebody who seems a little like sneakier? Dana Wheeler Nicholson. Is yeah. it a yeah. chance? Yeah, right. If you chance had like, to put in a diverse character, like anything, right. it's just like, here's this generic monosyllabic white guy who has yeah. no charisma or personality at all. And he's going to be in five scenes. Right. You want like a David Pamer Buscemi kind of a person. Yeah. Buscemi. Yeah. 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 Kevin, yeah, yeah. Kevin Powell. We were yeah. going to yeah. yeah. Pollock, I mean. Yeah. yeah, yeah. What's age the worst? We mentioned, uh, Janet saying during the Aaron cross examination that she would have killed the priest. She would have cut his eyes out. It's like, what's going on, Janet? Yeah. That jumped out to me rewatching it this time. I was like, this is a little much in the cross examination. So when John Mahoney's a bad guy, I just, my feelings get hurt. Do you because... consider him a bad guy and say anything? Yeah, kind of. Definitely. Yeah. Well, but, I mean, and that one is a more mistakes. understandable he's bad guy. bilking <laughs> elderly people out of their fortunes. Yeah. He's trying to give Diane the that. life she wants. <laughs> I, don't, I just like John Mahoney. I don't I like love when he's John a bad Mahoney. guy. Yeah. I wish they had gone with like a more of a bad guy, bad guy. He's pretty convincing in this. No, part. I know he he's is. Awesome. It's just he's really I, good. I don't like seeing John Mah Mahoney go heel. He's well, he he was kind of like a full time heel in our lives. If you were a fan of Fraser Crane, true. You know, like he was kind of the the bane of Fraser's existence. Were you a big Fraser guy? I love Fraser. Uh, Did another, you guys watch Fraser? I never really liked. What it. What the fuck? Yeah, I didn't yeah. really watch it. Oh my god, guys! Yeah, I never I, really liked it. It wasn't. Like, ahead, I was this, never this like. This was John Mahoney's Apex Mountain. I get it. Was being in this movie while Frazier was at the top. Of I the never ratings. really liked the Kelsey Grammer, David Hyde Pierce. Oh my god, the Emmys all fucking jerk circling about how great that they was were a together. Classic <laughs> McBride movie. <laughs> <I> mean, <laughs> is this like I don't like Troy from Reality Bites? Like these high flying uh, yeah. assholes. Thing? Frazier Crane. That's why. That's why taint. you cruised right by the Nathaniel Hawthorne quote. You didn't want to hear yeah, about that. Nah, Frazier Crane was the original podcaster. What are you talking about? He was crushing with the microphone. Never really was. Watched it. That's that's just. I'm sorry. Any other what's age the worst? Uh, I think Shaughnessy reminding Janet that she was bawling Marty is an HR violation. <laughs> yeah, it's true. It's <laughs> and, and, it's and I'm also mid glad that we left bawling in 1996. Yeah. Uh, Are you this this turn <laughs> this run through the movie too? I if you watch so like he they get that kid Alex John Cena right yeah. and they're like. He's like, yeah, the archbishop calls it purging the devil. And then Marty goes back to the crime scene and finds the exact videotape because it says sermon purging the devil. But you have to like freeze frame to tell why Marty picks that tape. Mm -hmm. So otherwise, it's just like, so Marty just goes back to the crime scene and this guy's got homemade porn in his house. 
and and Marty picks the exact right tape and then right. knows to fast forward. So it's like it's a little bit of a. I had that in the Ron Burgundy Flute Award Best Time for a Pee Break. The movie kind of gets Watching a little sloggy. Yeah. No, that gets a little sloggy during that stretch. This movie's in a, a two hours and 10 it minutes. It was actually, it was originally like three plus and yeah. we cut it down. I feel like we could have banged this out in two hours. I, there's agree, some, I agree. There's well, some slog. The last 45 is great. Was there a better title for this movie? Primal Fear is good. What if they just called it Butcher Boy? Well, there was a movie right around this time. Was Butcher Boy in the 90s or was it early 2000s? Isn't that like a Ken Loach movie? It's like Patrick McCabe novel. McCabe novel. It's like an Irish movie. Anyway, Mike Lee, right? No, no. Neil Jordan. Neil Jordan. Neil Jordan. 98. 97? 97. Well, that's Primal Fear came out in 96. I don't think Should Primal Fear the is the best title for the movie. I think there was a movie called The Man with Two Faces that that would have been an interesting yeah, title that's right. for this movie. Kind of, yeah. Best quote. You're worse than the thugs you represent. I always like when stuff like that, that gets thrown in a movie. All right, Stephen A. Smith, hottest take award. Do you have one, CR? Uh, Marty's whole, like, I, I just, I'm not sure Marty's a great lawyer. Like, in the the opening, like, gambit of defending Aaron is, like, there was a third man. Yeah. And it's, like, mm -hmm. then he's, like, gets all mad at Tommy and Naomi. He's, like... I'm running a third man defense and I don't have a third man. It's like, you fucking made the third right. man up, man. Who, who like, made like, that up, buddy? Yeah. Well, for, uh, furthermore, like, uh, let's unpack why Marty wants to take the case. It's a high profile case, right? Yeah. The, the, the killing of a significant figure in the community. But it's an open and shut case to anybody who knows anything about the case. Right. So he just, so went, there is no case. Right. It's a, they, the, the district attorney thinks that he's just going to plead no contest. So like, what does he have to gain from that? It's it's strange. I, and then it's like, is he going for this because he sees something in Aaron in the beginning where he's like, I can actually help this person. I think person. halfway yeah. through you start to buy into that idea, yeah. but at the very beginning it's unclear. I don't I, I don't I never really understood that. I have a, a somewhat related one, which is when you think about Norton's performance, is his work as Aaron Stampler, who is a, his creation, Roy is the real Stampler, purposefully actually not that great and a little hammy so i i had a thing and i also i was going to mention this in what's age the best actually i forgot which is that there, i was i went back and watched it this time specifically for clues like to see if there's any other times where there's a tell right and the only time i could really find is when tommy goes to aaron slash roy's room he's got absalom absalom by william faulkner on his nightstand mm. and that doesn't seem like a book Aaron would be able to really get through because I can't get through it, right, you know? Right, And that was, like, the only, like... Because, you know, if you watch Fight Club, you can see all these little things where it's like, oh, wait a second. But I don't know. Like, I don't know. Do you think Aaron is supposed to be so duh, duh, duh because, like, he basically makes fun of Aaron in that first interrogation. Right, and, and Roy, obviously, at the end of the movie, is like, I've been waiting for you to figure out what I've been doing here. And he's almost disappointed up until the point Took when Marty one. doesn't yeah. realize it. But also... Even as an actor, the Aaron character, when you know what's happened and you watch the movie again, is like, a, it's, it's, it, it doesn't totally work. You're like, is there something wrong with this kid? What's really going on here? And then also the secondary question related to that is, in his life, was Aaron, did Aaron look, talk, and act like Roy all the time? I have, this is a major... I had that as an unanswerable question. Okay. For me. Unanswerable yeah. as well. Well, let's just do it now. Well, it's like, what was wouldn't they have had plan? any of the other altar boys be like, no, actually, this guy talked like right, and he's well, a I, don't, I think guy. that in the context of Save Your House and all that, like he was Aaron the whole time. What I don't understand is like, what's like, what was Roy's pl plan? Did he like come from Kentucky, go to Chicago with the hope of being picked up by the Archbishop and becoming a serial killer, or? Like, like, I, at what point does he start to think of this whole thing? Right. And were Linda and, and Rushmore his first killings? Or has he killed before? Is he a serial killer or is he abu right. an abused person lashing out? And what are we trying to say about altar boys? No. I mean, that's, that's come to the fore. Here's my hottest take. I just don't say Aaron Rodgers is going to be good on the Jets what this the year. Fuck, Did you see the what stats? What the fuck is wrong with you? Did you see the deep stats? What the fuck are you talking about? Now, I have nothing right now. Here's my take. The Mets just <laughs> wasted $450 million this season. <laughs> just yeah. let me have this for a month. The deep stats were pretty unencouraging. Okay. Sharp had a lot of stuff he out. He had an injury. I get it. On his hand. 
because again, guys who are that old, they they tend to like really regenerate faster. You know. Let's circle back to this when Joel Embiid is down on the ground in about six months. <laughs> For the Knicks. On the Knicks. <laughs> my hottest take a word. Um, my mom's favorite actor is Richard Gere. We know. So I've spent a lot of time yeah. Richard Gere just playing on a TV in my Richard house. Is Richard Gere in the way that Harrison Ford is Mallory Rubin's favorite actor? That she just wants to like nail him to the wall? Yeah. Or is it like he's a great performer and he no, should have been she, Oscar Did you tell nominated. your mom we were doing this? All time most. She's just in love with Richard okay. Gere. And it's funny, like his contemporaries in the eighties and nineties, it's you know, it's Hanks, it's Michael Keaton, it's Jeff Bridges. Jeff Bridges is a good one. And then as we Dennis get into Quaid. the nineties, yeah, he's in all those things. But it's funny to think if you had played if you just move guys around, like what's Richard Gere's field of dreams mm -hmm. if he's in the Costa oh, part. Yeah. Like that's where the Richard Gere case kind of falls apart, where there's just parts. Costner, I think, could have been in this movie as the lead guy. Oh, yeah. Yeah. But mm -hmm. I'm positive Richard Gere couldn't have been like Maverick in Top Gun. Or... <laughs> well, but he's an officer and a gentleman. You don't think so? I don't think he could have been Maverick in Top Gun. Okay. That's one of the singular I don't think he could have been yeah. Ray Kinsella in Field of Dreams. And ah. could he have been the dad in Sleep Us in Seattle? Well... I think the problem is what your so. mom thinks of Richard Gere, which is like he's a smoke show. So could he be this bumbling, like, like kind of like, out. yeah, kind yeah. of down and out guy? It's hard. Could he have been the Tom Hanks role in Philadelphia? Yes. I that's you think so he would have that's shaved his head? He well, you know I what agree. I actually would have said? Is I don't that, think he has enough native empathy. He certainly could do the Denzel part. Uh, for sure. Yeah. He, he would nail that. That's, a, that's an interesting question. I feel like it's possible. That he never really got a chance so that to do was, something like that. So the hottest take part of this was my mom would argue he just didn't get the right parts and he was in King David and all these things. Yeah, yeah. But I find, I think there's a Richard Gere aspect to Richard Gere that overpowers seeing him in weird roles that aren't Richard Gere type roles. I think he, where it's like he has to almost make sense. It has to be a part where like, oh, I can see Richard Gere in that part. But once you once you deviate from that. That's where we get weird. It's such a strange thing, right? Because he's, you know, he was in Chicago like six years later, which was a huge movie, Oscar winner. He's basically the star of the movie and widely praised. And like, you know, he, he went on to do like a lot of great stuff. It's not, he's not like a, he didn't miss, yeah. you know, like he was one of the movie stars of the 80s and yeah. 90s for sure. But, but he was never almost been, like never a, been nominated, right? I don't think so. No. Yeah, he was almost like an NBA star who ended up with twenty eight thousand points, but mm -hmm. never played like in the conference finals, like yeah. Adrian Dantley kind of guy. Yeah. 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 Alex English. Yeah. yeah. Like, He's like Alex English. Alex English yeah. is a great one. Casting what ifs. DiCaprio was the original choice for Aaron Roy, and he turned it down. It's a pretty great what if. He could have done it. Great point of his career pre Titanic. <clears throat> couple years after this boy's life, he's old enough. He could have been totally convincing so as a destroyed 19-year-old altar that boy. That people are like, if he's in this movie, something must be coming. Right? Like, no, that's the not thing. that big. He does, he's Norton, in like Romeo and Juliet age. Romeo and Juliet. Norton is yeah. billed like sixth in this movie. Norton's name comes after Alfred it's Woodard in the credits. brilliant how they frame that. So smart. So you're just like, oh, okay, this guy's just like... I think all that. So you think of Leo's in it, you're waiting for something else. But it, you, you don't think any differently of Edward Norton in this movie going into it than you would have of James Marshall being in A Few Good Men. It has to be an unknown for it to work as well yeah. as it does. He has already been I think he I was agree. nominated for Gilbert Grape, right? Yeah. He I mean he'd already been Norton says Leo, who's a really good pal of mine, he had passed on it. Weirdly, that did a weird thing for me because, of course, it's like a once in a lifetime career shot. But I thought Leo was terrific. I really thought he was one of the better young actors around. I thought he was right about the movie. I was like, this is a mess. That was why Leo passed because the movie mm -hmm. was a mess and they really changed the script. Kind of figured it out as yeah. it went along. He added the stutter. They figured out a couple reveals near the end and they made it. But that was why Leo passed. I mean, it's tough for me to say Leo would would have been worse than Ed Norton in this. I just movie. think it would have been different. I think there's there's not that many times in movies where you get to see like a kind of complete unknown do something like this. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. That was that was really my hottest take, which I burnt in the first 10 minutes. But I was like, I don't know if there's ever been a better debut performance. The Ruffalo Hannah Ribbonek Partridge overacting word. Uh, Richard Gere. Yeah. That, I mean, a couple times. Yeah. Couple. When, when in particular? There's one time when he's yelling at Aaron. I have a fucking right. 
I'm Aaron Stampler's attorney, you little shit. <laughs> I feel like he's doing that purposefully, performatively, though. No? He does yeah, a lot no, of, like, he, he does a, a lot of he, he dials it. Yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah. All right. My guy Rick has down. But I like I times. like it. Do you think yeah. uh living nerve ending Laura Linney is overdoing it a couple of times <laughs> in this movie? I feel like she might Very be fair. a little bit of handshaking with the cigarette in, you know, in the left hand. Best that guy award. Joe Spano from Hill Street Blues popping in. He he became a that guy for How years about and years. Al- and the years. alderman? Joe Spano? He's like like that cop who goes in. Yeah, the overcoat. Cop. Yeah. Right, right, what right. about Tony Plana? Alderman Martinez. He was the, the alderman, yeah. yeah. Good one. Also, just for what it's worth, Lester Holt, CBS. No, oh, yeah. That's right. Lester. Still working in yeah. Chicago, yeah. They used all Chicago people for this. Uh, Dion Waiters, can we just give it to Manny and move on? Oh, I was going to say, is Brower in it too much? I think he's in it too much. Okay. Yeah, I think he's one of, I'd say he's one of the five or six stars. Bauer's in three scenes. Okay, let's go. Let's go. Who Bauer. do you have? You have the girl on the sex tape? Uh, <laughs> yep. Enjoyed her work. Uh, I really like this. Shad's like, I go with Linda. Uh, <laughs> That's not what he said. <laughs> Moving on. Uh, I do like the moment when Terry O'Quinn is like, uh, <laughs> he really threw me off my game. <laughs> <laughs> Sweatpants about, Bill is just about like Linda, dealing yeah. right now. Like, Bill, you know, real loose. <laughs> free balling it, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're not balling anymore. We're just free balling here. Uh, when uh, he's like, what does he say to Laura Linney? Where he's like, start looking for a new job. Yeah, start looking for a new job. <laughs> yeah, yeah that, he's a good deal like waiter. Yeah. yeah. Plus, it's always fun to see him in any of these movies yeah, from this hair. era before he's lost. Yeah, before lost lock. lock. Recasting couch. <laughs> I I mean, the reporter can come up with 200 possibilities yeah, that are like, better than the it's reporter. It's like, was John Cusack busy to it's do like two weeks? Kind of a small part. You, I think I, but you just like, pulled what, a bill there a little bit. Oh, like, we're, can we get Denzel <laughs> this guy who has two lines <laughs> is, fuck, is Brando <laughs> still alive did he just come in could, could have had like Campbell Scott <laughs> yeah sure could have grabbed him for yeah. Yeah. was Olivia had to Haviland not alive at that time <laughs> um Connie Britton in the more tyranny role I know yeah, Sean yes, would like it more absolutely I do love more tyranny though she's got five lines I think more tyranny is great she's yeah. like what do you want us to do next Marty <laughs> Like, 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 we could just let more tyranny have now. Have that. Half fast internet research mentioned a lot of this stuff, but um, in the book or the script, there's no stutter. When Roy shoves Richard Gere's like character lived, against yeah. the prison cell wall, Gere seems shocked because Norton ad libbed that one. He didn't know it was coming. Mm. And then he also ad libbed the slow clap. It's one of the great movie moments of the 1990s. Great slow cap. I was yeah. gonna, slow is, clap is it era. Apex Mountain for slow clap? Flat no, flat. Brubaker. Um, wow. Immediate. Or um, what Brubaker Can't Buy Me Love. When? What's Can't Buy Me Love? Can't no, Buy Me Love, great slow clap. That's not, does not compete with Aaron Stampler. I'm sorry. I like Can't Buy Me Love. I too I, just I, I, I dare television. say Brubaker doesn't compete with Aaron Stampler either. Brubaker has an entire prison doing, Brubaker created the slow clap. Nobody even knew what a slow clap was. But uh, Brubaker stars one of your mortal enemies. Redford. Listen, I respect the work. I just, okay. right. the rest of it speaks for it's itself. It's kind of like Kareem, like your relationship to yeah. Redford. Similar Redford's to Kareem. by Kareem. The police station where they go to see Stampler was the same exterior used for Hill Street Blues. Where our guy Hoblet was the producer and director of a bunch of this. Where are you at on Fallen? Hoblet's follow up. Eh, not bad. I like eh, it. It's yeah. okay. Some great uh, John Goodman yeah. Yeah. movie. Yeah. Some uh, Elias Coteus in that movie. Apex Mountain. Gear, no. Laura Lenny, no. Brower is, is Homicide on at this point? No. Yeah, it, is, it is, right? Yeah. So maybe, maybe for him. I th- I he think, didn't win the Emmy for did he he won eventually right I think he might have won for Brooklyn Nine Nine oh gosh um, for Pendleton nobody else in this movie Mahoney Mahoney is on Frasier when this movie comes out and then the same year as she's the one where he plays the he, oh you're right that's good he plays Ed Burns and Mike McGlone's father right? about multiple personality murderers oh, that's a good one. I was trying to think of this. I think it might be Apex Mountain for for multiple personality disorder. What are what are the com- wow. what's the competition? Uh, Sybil, right? Isn't that yeah. isn't Sybil about a, multi- per- a girl with multiple personality disorder? Psycho. Yeah, I uh, guess Psycho, psycho. psycho. kind of wins. Psycho. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Jeez, Psycho. Just hear me out. 
I think this is Apex Mountain in general for sorted VHS sex tapes. Same year as Pamela and Tommy. Whoa. Oh, yeah. 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 Yep. Sorted VHS tapes became a thing right around here, yep. and it's in the movie. When you would watch the Pam and Tommy tape, would you wear sweatpants? <laughs> <laughs> Best racehorse name, Butcher Boy? Yeah, that's good. Love it. Yeah. Perfect. No notes. Here comes Butcher Boy! <laughs> I like that scene when Gear's going in to see Stampler, and he walks past a Chicago cop who's like a Chicago, he's definitely a Chicago cop in The Fugitive. You've seen him in a bunch of movies before. Yeah. And he's just like, oh, Butcher Boy, huh? And Gear's like, yeah, I forgot his real name. <laughs> You're right. Pick a nits. I got one. I have three that I'm excited about. You go. Well, the biggest one for me is when they go to barley corns at night and Janet walks in and she goes, Stu, I'll have the usual. And then they just bring her a Bud Light. Yes, I thought the same thing. It's like, that's not a fucking usual. That's a beer. But that's a usual for you. It's that's no. not the usual. The Chris usual is a, is a, drink for is a drink that they know to make because yeah, you Chris, are this. Oh, I disagree with this. Chris is 100% right. What? No. The usual? the usual is not a Bud Light. Just say Bud Light. I'll just be like, Stu, can I get a Bud Light? Can I get a beer? The usual is like Bud Light with like a shot of whiskey in it yeah. or something. Yeah. And like a lime on top. The usual for her should be like a Cosmo or like a... Or like All a, that the usual indicates is that she's in a bar five nights a week. I don't think it has anything to do with the com complexity of the drink. The I disagree. I agree. And you used to be a bartender and you're backing me up, aren't you? If somebody was like, the usual, Bill, and you're like, you mean a fucking ice water? Like... <laughs> You don't say the usual for a beer, especially like a pretty available beer. Yeah. All right. I, I Just in general, you just say the name of the beer. You don't say the usual I mean, for a beer. It, I, I guess it's more just that it's meant to indicate something about the character. Sure. Not, then have, get then, a fucking then he whiskey. should bring her yeah. a fucking but, whiskey sour. But yeah. She's a grounded regular gal who works for the state's I know she's drinking attorney. a liter of Diet Coke before that. I love I'm that. just it's saying. 20 ounce of Coke. Yeah. And that's the scene previous to that. The usual has to be at least a little interesting. You wanted her drinking like an apple martini. Yeah. Not, well, not something, it doesn't have to be like overly feminine. I just mean like it, it's a cocktail that this guy's like, oh, I better get started. Janet's here, you know? <laughs> if you order coffee, you'd be like, oh, the usual. Right. It's just a black coffee. But oh, what if it was I'd just I'd rather a, just say black coffee. What if it was just a neat whiskey? I go to the same coffee place every day and they know what I want, but I always am like, hey, and they'll be like, do you want, do you want your regular? Like what you usually what, get? And what is it? It's like a light roast with room so that I can put milk in. So a, a black coffee. Yeah, but that's a, that's different though because coffee requires variation. Like, but it's like a light roast. A beer can't be changed, and it's also a, a large. They of know it's it a, can. It can have a lime in it. Could be served. Nobody with puts water. fucking lime in Bud Light. I, I, they have Bud Light lime. What are but you talking about? That's not 1996. <laughs> I, I'm I'm just I, I, I'm not gonna <laughs> die on this. Really, I really don't care about this at all whatsoever. It's like it's in the movie for a reason. Is my point. I understand, but when they bring her Come the Bud Light, drink. I'm like, this is the prop guy not thinking this through. To me, I guess all that it indicates is that she's like a civil servant and she just drinks Coke. Make it a weirder Bud Light. beer then, like a like an international beer. Yeah, make beer. it be an Amstel. Put a shot of whiskey in yeah. it. Well, I'm sure that there was a product placement reason <laughs> for the beer being in the movie. This has been a year-long losing streak for you in the real <laughs> this, dating back I'm, to I'm the Hanks Cruise argument. I've been argument. getting killed on pods lately where people are just like, you're wrong and you suck. And I'm like, what the? No, but you're should very, I quit? Like, what, I think you could have just been like, great point, CR. And and to your credit, yeah. you you don't you can't. Like, I I am just being honest. In I know. the same way that you know, I you was being honest about the You should say thing. the usual and then just have a bad take, and we'll know it's coming. <laughs> I honestly am thinking of retiring from this medium. I'm dead serious. I'm just not into it. Oh come on! <laughs> I'm really not. <laughs> Wait, I'm gonna lift you up with this. Why didn't Richard Gere just use an insanity defense? <laughs> Why did we even have it's, this it's movie? A, it's a great, it's a, Is there yeah. a better pick and dip than this? It's a great take. You you do this whole roundabout, well, complicated they, way to get he, where they, we could have just gotten. No, but yeah. they didn't at the time when they made the. But the, it's really it's very Missoula of, of <laughs> Marty Vale <laughs> to be like, what if I did this really elaborate third man defense? Uh, <laughs> but he we they didn't have the Francis McDormand interrogation in front of the camera, which is that's when things flip. Right? Yeah, that's when it's yeah, clear yeah. that Roy is around. How about insanity defense for? I stabbed a guy 80 times. I was covered in his blood and I carved his eyes out. And then Gears' response is there was a third guy. 
Maybe. I, I mean, that goes back to what I was saying where I was like, I don't know why he took this case. Yeah, and it's like his whole thing is like, don't you think it's possible that someone else was in the room? And they're all like, uh... That's actually one other thing that you always hear in these movies when you were doing the tropes, which is you always have a lawyer say, I just need one juror right. to think there's reasonable oh, doubt. You always it. hear that. I love those. that. Yeah. See, he's trying to make it up to me because he knows that I'm feeling low. He's trying to back me publicly. <laughs> I always back him publicly. <laughs> Oh my God. You have the best takes. Everyone knows that. <laughs> <laughs> the only thing worse than getting dunked on is being patronized. So I what won't else have does it. Joe to say that thing? A cool yeah. reference, bro? A cool reference. Yeah. <laughs> you always have the best references. Sean reference. couldn't rape a fly. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right. Here's my number one picking it. This just in general drives me crazy in movies is the omnipotent cigarette. And the person just not smoking. Yes. It. It's oh. it's a really yeah. weird it's bit. It's out of control in this movie. She she smokes it when she starts. Doesn't this, he say at the beginning, I thought you quit? Does he? Does yeah, he she say says, he I does. cut down. Yeah. yeah. If we did a batting average. Well, she of, gets scolded for smoking in the a, Indoors the everywhere, yeah. yeah. But never actually smokes. If we did the batting average of how much she actually smokes versus holding the cigarette, it's like... Point so zero, do you think that's because Linny didn't smoke? I think she's not a smoker. And they're like, no, no, your character has to smoke. My experience is that most actors that you see are smokers. Personally. Or a lot of them are. In real life, you mean? Especially of this era. Right. Where they're like, but who did we say? We did this on another pod. Who was the worst smoker? Was it Cruz? Yeah, but you, it's, he's I mean, Cruz is the worst ever. Isn't he yeah. holding it like this or something? Yeah. You know, But there, there's been some bad smokers. And then there are the smokers where you're like, well, that one was already lit like before the cameras yeah, were rolling. Wow. Yeah. Peaking with De Niro and yeah. Goodfellas, like the all time great one. cigarette smoking we've ever seen. Yeah. I was Masterclass. really happy to see Jenna Ortega smoking the other day. Or like a, in real uh, in real life. Yeah. It's cool. It was cool. <laughs> Who was the one you loved? What was the one we did where you were just going nuts? Oh, Edie Falco in uh <laughs> in uh <laughs> <God Copland. laughs> <laughs> You were gonna throw it all away for her. Yeah. Uh and then the other one I had was, um, by the way, so when people watch, if you ever watch this movie, just watch all the Laura Lenny smoking stuff. We could cut a YouTube clip of just her doing this with a shake. Um, and then we mentioned the other altar boys. The, not one other altar boy Brent coming on the stand. Here's Bobby. He was yeah. an altar boy who worked with Aaron. I think the idea Bobby, is did Roy, you ever have an idea yeah. of? Is it possible that they were afraid of Aaron? I would have loved to have found out in the stand. Was it, were but any you, of the you, lawyers going to this testify movie? Testify because you're afraid. Uh, oh. Alex is trying to disappear. Yes, Alex is trying to get away. Any other picking nits? I think you're. Why didn't they not consider the insanity defense is incredibly strong? Thanks. Sequel, prequel, prestige TV, all black cast are untouchable. I was trying to think of this as a prestige TV. I think it would be good as a miniseries, like a four episode thing. But well, it's like you're the night of thing. Could this have been like a seven episode? HBO I also show? would be like, they would have to send out only the first couple of episodes because, like, I just don't think people would be able to help themselves and be like, what, make sure you're watching the fourth one tonight. Mm. Big, big twist, you know? Well, they probably blow out the Manny part. Yeah. Yeah. The whole and Mahoney's character in yeah. real estate. Yeah. yeah. I we, think maybe like a CBS style prequel sitcom called Young Aaron. I think it would be fun. <laughs> just him, him in Kentucky. <laughs> just, just Aaron in Crickside. You yeah. know, that would be fun. Is this movie better with Wayne Jenkins, Danny Trejo, Catherine Hahn, Steve Buscemi, Sam Jackson, JT Walsh, or Philip Baker Hall? God damn, Roy! <laughs> I didn't know I was representing a super villain! <laughs> You were going to go away a long fucking time, big boy. Man, let's go watch the one shining moment highlight reel of the 96 Kentucky Wildcats featuring Ron Mercer and Tony Dell. <laughs> you think Aaron was a big cats guy? <laughs> when did you put that together? <laughs> okay. uh, that was a good team. Yeah, Patino. That was a good team. <laughs> 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 At first, I was like, "This is too easy." Yeah, you know, just putting together the the cop and the criminal. But but then you you really close the loop with Patino. Well, I was like, "What what was going on in Kentucky in the in the mid '90s?" You okay. think Stampler's a huge hoop head? Yeah, yeah. He's <laughs> elevated yet again. Just one Oscar. Who gets it? I mean, Norton only was the only one who got nominated. I would vote for him. Pretty weird for scummy trash like this to get nominated for any Academy yeah. Awards. I enjoy it. 
Probably an answer more questions. I have two good ones. Is Ed Norton the greatest multi-personality actor ever? He had this, Fight Club, and The Hulk. There's uh, three. Yeah. Does anyone have four? No, I, I can't argue. Anyone with got nominated for an Oscar for one of them? Excellent Who's take. Who's competing against him? Excellent take. Thank you. Uh, off that one. What do you think that says about Ed Norton? That's a good question. That he, the, sees, he sees a multiplicity of personalities within every character. Is this movie better if Aaron's alter ego is in Roy, but it's Worm from Rounders? <laughs> <laughs> worm wouldn't hurt a fly. And he turns into Roy and he's yeah. being like, let's go get a game. I got one yeah. lined up an hour away. <laughs> the he country club, into, yeah. Yeah. You know what gets me? They takes, he takes him to Atlantic City and we just, it just the movie turns into Rounders every time he's Roy. I, I think about how far away Aaron is from Worm. What a great actor. What a great actor. That's yeah. what I'm saying. Those first four, man. Best double feature choice of this movie? I had a, I had Spotlight. Just because of the, the you I like know, it. The, the, That's the, a good the one. Abuse scandal stuff. I was going to say Rounders, but I just, I couldn't did think you of a better one. Did you skip possibly unanswerable questions? I did too. Do you have any? I have one. What do you got? Um, do you think it would be cool? Yeah, because we're always looking to iterate here. Should I create a character called Podcast Roy? <laughs> And uh, I'll tell you how it works. Bill, start talking to me about James Harden. Chris, what's going on with James Shut Harden? Shut your mouth, you little girl! <laughs> <laughs> but like maybe like every pod, Bill just keeps pushing and pushing and pushing. Yeah, yeah, he's already given you a few moments And like then that. Podcast Roy comes out. <laughs> podcast CR. <laughs> I like it. Um, yeah, I had Spotlight or, or another one was Widows. Another good Chicago crime movie. I feel like this movie, one of the reasons why it's so fun is it's in this great lineage of 60s movies like this, like uh, um, Anatomy of a Murder, where a very similar thing happens, where there's like a revelation to the lawyer who tries the case about what the defendants were actually doing. That is like, it's, mm. part, it's part of a story. Like the novel too is part of this like long lineage of these kinds of movies. So that would be a good one. The Indian Red Zawatne Award for what happened the next day. Um, I think Aaron slash Roy gets out pretty soon. Yep. Becomes an NBA insider, becomes Adrian Wojnarowski. I, yeah. It's funny you should say. I had, I had. Would Roy become a Chicago sports radio guy? I mean, that's all related to his interest in the Wildcats that year. <laughs> Is Adrian slash Woj similar to Aaron slash Roy? I'm gonna say yes. Wow. You, yeah. It's interesting. Adrian, <laughs> interesting take. You shut your mouth, wind horse. <laughs> I could just see Roy really killing Jay Cutler. You know, <laughs> in that era. <laughs> this guy's a disgrace. <laughs> Shut your mouth, Cutler. What piece of memorabilia would you want from this movie? I'm going to go with the rarely seen. I don't know if I'd want anything from this movie, even though I really liked it. What about the Cardinal's fingers? <laughs> <laughs> the fake fingers? <laughs> yeah. That's a pretty great shot where it's like, is it showing slashing? Yeah, yeah. Fingers pretty go it's, pretty, it's pretty brutal. Maybe yeah. Laura Lenny's cigarettes? Yeah, she's yeah. not using them. What yeah. was she smoking? <laughs> I think Benson and Hedges or Virginia's. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The Virginia's. Me, that's another. Well, they're one. they're kind of making a comeback in the Idol. The Slims. A comeback, you say? Well, mm -hmm. it's supposedly the weekend has Carte Blanche to smoke whatever he wants. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if you caught that. He did. Do you think the weekend screwed that up or the character screwed that up? Well, it's like a perfect little microcosm of the question of the show, which is: Are they in on this joke or are they not in on this joke? Right. Well, this will be recorded. This is going up after the finale. I guess we'll know the answer. I don't think we will, to be honest with you. <laughs> the finale. <laughs> Where we just skip to the last episode. Only CR and I will be watching. The Coach Finstock Award for Best Life Lesson. I, just, like, I like if you want justice, go to a whorehouse. If you want to get fucked, go to court. Hmm. <laughs> That's a little... A, on the nose? A little on the nose for the first line of the movie. That would have been yeah. the best quote. <laughs> What about just invent a second personality and you can kill anyone? Okay. I was bipolar the whole time. OJ should have thought of this. This is a good note for uh, for podcasters too, but a small piece of advice. Don't use the word heinous in a courtroom. Half the jury won't know what you're talking about. <laughs> yeah, that was good advice. Who won the movie? Norton. Yeah. I think Gear's wonderful in this movie and it doesn't really work because he's, he's, well, he's practically in every frame. But Norton, Norton makes it like a rewatchable and a special. Do you think Richard Gere could have been in Braveheart? 
He was in First Night the year before this movie came out. <laughs> yeah. And I think I think the people spoke on that one. They did. Did you know who directed First Night? Mike, uh, no, I don't. John McTiernan? Do you remember? No. Jerry Zucker, the director of oh, Airplane. Wow. Trying do you to think that Richard things? Gere could have been Jack Ryan? And Ghost. Uh, I do. I do. Do you think he could have been Vincent Vega? No, I don't. But that's interesting. Gear in a Tarantino movie is interesting. He seems like Tarantino would be like, I always liked Richard Gear, and I just could never find the right script. That's Chuck Klosterman that you're doing. Yeah, right there. sorry, but, sorry, Chuck. Uh, he loves Quentin loves the Breathless remake starring Gear from yeah, the mid eighties. My mom's favorite movie I, ever. I was is just going through yeah. this in my head, and. The the roles that I most want geared at to have had Clooney just took them all, Oceans, Out of Sight. Oh, why wasn't Gear in Oceans? Wow, Gear got market corrected in the two thousands. Did George Clooney market correct Gear? Holy shit! Fuck, he didn't even have that good of a career. He did though. This is this is an emerging Bill Simmons take. Oh, that, that you're like, well, Clo his, Clo I mean, one of the, the directing career is one of the worst directing careers. Yes, anyone said. We're, we need like a rich text to break this down, really. Like, well, I don't know what a good Clooney movie is for. You guys are perfect storm. I think that Clooney kind of took over from Gear, where he just had a couple big movies and then mostly bombs. I think it's because you're not an Oceans guy. Yeah. I am an Oceans guy. How am I? I'm not an Oceans guy now. I, you've, you've ne you've I got Oceans, appeared. Out of Sight, Descendants. Yeah. What about From Dust Till Dawn? That's the real test of the Clooney head. I like it. I like Dust Till Dawn. Movie's fine. Um, Craig, what'd you think of Primal Fear? I like courtroom movies, I think, more than probably the average person my age. I think, in general, mm. the courtroom might be the best setting, the best location for a scene. Might have the highest ceiling. Like, the best courtroom scene, I think, really, really brings it home. Um, I don't think this was the best courtroom movie I've ever seen. I Like, going back to, like, the verdict. <laughs> Fair <Yeah>. enough. <laughs> what? <laughs> I, I, I heard you guys have spent four hours <laughs> last night and two hours on this pod. I'd just like you to know you wasted your time, I idiots. Just had <laughs> I had just had trouble with, like, believing Gear wanted to do this, to be honest. The whole time. Not the character, sorry. Uh, Martin. I, I didn't understand his motivation why he would want to do this case. Yeah, and I thought that affected the whole movie. I think, like, with, with Newman well, and the good, verdict. We didn't talk about that. Why did he want to do this case? We said we did. That I was did, Sean's, yeah. no, that was no, Sean's why, point. But, but why ultimately, if you had to make the case... I think he just wants to be in the spotlight. Yeah. I think he's obsessed. He's, he he's says in he the middle of a magazine being, profile. Yeah, he's TV trying to become... TV. Yeah, he's trying to become a high-profile lawyer. It's just the actual details of the case don't align with what yeah. a very savvy high-profile lawyer um, would do. I also... I can't believe this made $100 million. I know it's the, it, it's, it was the era. But just imagining if this movie came out now and it's like Chris Pratt and Saoirse Ronan solve the murder of the Chicago Archbishop in theaters June 12th. I'll tell you what, we're going to find out because there's a movie coming out at the end of this year called Juror Number 2 oh, yeah. directed by 92-year-old Clint Eastwood starring oh, Nicholas Holt and Tony Collette that is a pure courtroom drama with a twist and it's got a great premise and movies like that never come out anymore. And Clint made it in 48 hours. <laughs> <laughs> I saw a photo of him from the set. From 20 he scenes in day looks one. like a man who is in his 10th um, uh, decade. Also, I hate to say this, but I think the slow clap was lame. Oh, come on, <laughs> yes, Craig. Yes. What the fuck? Get the Wait, fuck out can of I here. Suck, Craig. It sucks. Craig. Oh, my God. Did you know the twist before you watched the movie? No, I don't have a problem with the twist. The twist was great. I thought the specific slow clap ruined it. And I don't know if the slow clap has been ruined over the yes, years. It has and that been. it's a trope oh, it has now. Been. Yeah. I'm, but to I'm, me, I'm like, the slow clap So you is, didn't know the twist. I'm no. devastated by that take. The slow clap is hacky the, to the me. Slow clap, uh, Jeff Chow of The Ringer, we probably say, good for you, Marty, at the end of like yeah. every fifth meeting You'll that we have You'll be like, oh, together. I got a sandwich today. And Jeff will be like, good for you, Marty. And then Chris says, shut the fuck up, <laughs> Jeff. You're crying like a little girl. <laughs> Couldn't kick your own ass. <laughs> 